I got music to go with this, I see. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, Is it banjo music? Uh, it? Yeah, that, well, I'll tell you what. We went one, one year on, I think, 4th of July, we ended up in Little Cedar, and there were some people come to find out what we were doing there, and I could hear the banjos playing in the background. <laughs> we got out of there, and I've never been back. <laughs> you got it but I thought well. I would do something different than just show a bunch of slides that, you know, of, of different uh, elevators, or not elevators, but feed mills. So I thought I'd show you some that I know I've been modeled. Um, we'll start with one that was on my old layout. Uh, when I built the layout, I thought this was going to be the centerpiece of the layout, this uh, feed mill. It's called an elevator, but as you can see, the only thing they list up there is feed in, in, at this, in flower at this particular time. Um, and there are no storage silos at this. I'm, I'm not sure I could probably look up with the date on this thing. This photo was taken because of the auto accident. Uh, evidently the train must have hit this car or something. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, this is the uh, earliest photo I have of this uh, mill uh, here in the early 50s. I think that's a, a early 50s uh, Chrysler product sitting there. Uh, the light colored car, dot Plymouth, or I probably. Um, anyway, they went all in for Karina at that time. And uh, <laughs> this is a, a 59 photo that's kind of interesting is that they, they tore it down. They had uh, bins along the end, sheds for coal and hay. And uh, they tore those down and they put in a building where they can bag, uh, bag uh, feed and store it there. And they also have uh, some, some extra uh, containers there, so, some small bins for mixing different feeds. And being this is wintertime, uh, cement hoppers are not being used. So they clean them out and put them in feed service. Uh, what else is interesting about this is you can see they only put cladding on the, the lower half of the of the main building and didn't do the end, so they didn't have to repaint the sign again. And they've added two stave silos for holding. It took me years to figure out, it, matter of fact, when I was putting this together, to figure out one of the AFEs for this thing is there's a track that goes in behind this. And uh, they wanted that track extended so they could unload grain from boxcars. And I couldn't figure out why an elevator would be unloading grain. Well, it really wasn't an elevator. They were unloading boxcars and putting the material in the bins on those two stave silos in order to make uh, feed with them. Uh, this is a, a, a picture showing that the, the building was originally uh, silver, and then they put uh, white cladding on it. I, this is the first uh, scale drawing I've ever made of anything for modeling, and it's, this is as good as it gets. But I wanted to keep track of what I wanted to do to build this thing. Uh, and at this time, I don't know if I had a digital camera or not, but I wasn't taking pictures of everything I was doing. And today I was had a FaceTime with uh, Jason Clocky, and he's showing me a new, a new vignette, a new... Uh, customer that he's put in one of his towns. And I've seen, he showed me this progress three times of how he's doing this. And I'm asking him, you taking pictures of this? You know, nowadays there's no reason for not taking a photo of every step of everything you do just to keep on hand and eventually it may come in handy. Um, but you, when you're doing, going through these steps of building this stuff, you only get one shot at this. You know, once you go do the next step, it's too late to take a picture of the first step. But anyway, this is a picture that Czech, Czech French set took of that building when I first uh, put the thing together. Here I've got the decals for the thing. I remember over at Train Fest years ago, there was a fella over there doing custom decals. And he was from Wisconsin. Uh, but he had some it, it health, there was some health issues in his family and he got out of the business, but he was able to make these decals for me. And uh, this photo I threw in there 
because I uh, Cliff Hagman took it and I, he had a good camera at the time and I thought it was a neat photo, but it also shows that I built the, the elevator uh, um, head houses and basically just <coughs> set them on top of the roof. And this shows the end of uh, the decals for the end of the elevator. Um, this particular photo was supposed to be the cover of uh, a model railroad craftsman, and it was taken by the late Dave Murphy. Well, the uh, magazine people sometimes don't do anything till the last minute. Dave came over and took this picture. I sent it to him. They came back and said, it's going to be the cover in December. We need snow in the picture and we need it by tomorrow. So anyway, I had just bought a, a Sony digital camera, one of the little pocket ones, and you couldn't get much depth of field of it. But anyway, I, I, I took this picture and this was the one that was on the cover. I'd also used uh, some uh, photo editing uh, software from a friend had given me to take out the real, well, I think I used paint to get rid of the real trees and add the, the ones without leaves. Uh, but anyway, this that's what this photo was taken for. And then here's a photo that I think might have been in in Great Model Railroads or something. Andy Spranio took this photo. But anyway, uh, that railroad's long gone. And I saved that elevator because, or that feed bell because I really liked it. So when I'm building my present elevator or my present railroad, uh, the Zering uh, elevator in Zering, Iowa, Farmer's Elevator, same name, fortunately. You can see they had an elevator and they also had a feed mill attached to it. So I just added a, an elevator to the feed mill and recycled the thing. I had some decals left so I could put some, some of the striping around the elevator. <laughs> so sometimes you can reuse buildings again. Uh, next one I want to talk about is... Uh, this photo of uh, Farmersburg, Iowa, in Northeast Iowa on the Milwaukee Al-Qaeda branch. Uh, this is from Lakes. I bought this from Lake States. I don't know, they've got another name, but it's Lake States. This is from their collection. If you go there and look at the collections they have, they have beautiful photos, lots and lots and lots of them. And you can buy uh, images or have them uh, print you off some if you so desire. But uh, before I got this picture, I received this one from uh, someone maybe on this list. And uh, I thought that's a really neat elevator uh, mill. I should uh, build that thing. So anyway, <laughs> I threw these pictures in there just for Ron Christensen, just to show him there's the right way of doing it and Ron's way of doing it. If you want to, if you want to uh, <laughs> make a, aging, aging uh, paint. All right. <laughs> And uh, the first thing, the first step is to use an enamel or a lacquer paint and uh, paint all the pieces. And you can see I've used a couple of different colors of gray and some uh, floquo mud uh, just to give some kind of a coating uh, to the plastic. And then here I take an AK Interactive heavy chipping, which you can Amazon. And there's no reason not to get the stuff. And uh, here I've uh, hand brushed it on all of the pieces. Once that dried, then I painted it with acrylic paint. This is the tricky part. You have to use acrylic for the second coat. And so now all the pieces have been painted with a red acrylic. And I hate acrylic paint, but you have to do what you have to do. And then you, once that dry, you rewet it again. And then in this case, being this wood, I, I'm using an old X-Acto blade and I'm scraping off the red paint. And uh, that AK Interactive heavy chipping protects the first layer that's under there. So you end up with something like this. And I can use a mouse here. I've also accented some places here with colored pencil, as you can see. There's little areas here that I've darkened up uh, just for some contrast. Uh, this yeah, I, this is the picture I put in so you could see where I've used the color pencils. Uh, Prismacolor, you get them at uh, Hobby Lobby. Uh, and you can't have anything agriculture without having pigeons. 
Uh, here's a photo of the thing on the, on the layout. I may have showed this before, I'm not sure. It's hard to keep track. Uh, another photo showing the whole little section. This thing is on a, like a five by 16 and a half foot, 16 and a half inch uh, plate. Next up is uh, Jason Clocky. They were up on a trip and they, they were in uh, Spring Valley and they found this feed mill. And he, a lot more stuff that he took photos of, but we're interested in this feed mill. And what I did was took the thing and took all of the modern crap off of it and made it how it would have looked at my time and not given a whole lot of thought that maybe when Jason models the middle 60s, some of that other stuff might have been added by then. But anyway, it was uh, just cut out and put on the backdrop. So when you look at the, most of uh, Ostrander at Jason's, uh, it's in the background. on Because a lot of these feed mills, were not rail served. I was going to, I didn't have time or I forgot about it. There's a piece in uh, the MSNL had a news uh, letter they put out in, in the late fifties uh, for employees. And there's one of them where they were, they were talking about, I think in about 1958, losing all feed mill business to trucks. <laughs> Here's another one that uh, Jason and I took uh, he models Osage, and we were up there one time snapping a bunch of pictures. And uh, this is, a, I think this is looking south. And uh, his photo of the building, we're looking north. So this would be the other end of that of that uh, building that he built. What's, These were, what's that white round structure behind it? You know, this, he was in the process of, uh, uh, Spielberg was there, and they were in the process of making uh, a movie with dinosaurs and they needed some kind of a solution to kill them. So they ah. invented this big thing that was gonna squirt and kill the dinosaurs. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. I, I almost forgot about throwing that in. <laughs> I went to the movie yesterday, so <laughs> I'm, it's fresh in my mind. But anyway, this is Bob Gratlitz. Um He took a photo of, I, he can tell us where the building is is actually located. Uh, but he took a photo of a, a real neat feed mill and made a model of it. So I included it here. Um, there are not all feed mills were small. Um, this is a, one that was built in uh, Mesa City. It still stands here. It's not in use as a feed mill anymore, but other people use it for other things. Um, this would be an as-built photo from about uh, 19, late 1953, I'm guessing. Uh, here's what it would look like from the backside or the truckload outside after it was painted. Uh, what's interesting is the library had a, quite a few photos of this. And this would be, this is an electric end loader that they would use to unload uh, fee or materials, ingredients out of boxcars. And you can see that there's grading and they would uh, shovel or, or, or uh, and later drag the material out and it fall through the grating and be transported into the building. You can see uh, it has a totally enclosed motor here and a hydraulic pump up here to run the thing. Uh, this photo shows uh, the bagging operation there. Um, you can see the, the hopper with the material in it coming out bags and then the bags are being stitched and then the bags go down the chute and then there's a fellow down at the bottom that puts them on these uh these are i would call early pallets um don't know what they might have been made out of steel i don't think plastic was in use at the time and then here's the inside of the of the storage what's interesting is this is all one big open area but having a friend that actually switched this operation, they would request certain cars at certain doors. And, uh, you know, he always wondered why, because the building's open, but it kept the forklifts from going uh, or, or, down, up and down and instead of just back and forth. So they could run into each other. <laughs> uh, this would be the first load out of there going up to Minnesota. Uh, again, I can find the date for this, but that car is new in 51 
and it, it uh, would have been reweighed in after 30 months. So it has to be probably right away in early 1553. New modern Here's machine. Guy got a <laughs> forklift uh, loading the truck. Uh, then if you want to find out more about me building this thing, you can find this old issue of uh, MRH and uh, it, there's quite an extensive article uh, on building the thing. It was the only time I ever did a step-by-step -step article on building something. And then I talked a little bit about the operation. And then all I heard about for feedback, we want to know about the operation. We don't care about how you built it. So it kind of, <laughs> you can't win, you know? Yeah. But anyway, speaking of building, this thing was all, all poured in a, as a slip. It was all done at, uh, at one time. And then here's my building in progress. Yeah. I could add a lot more photos, but I didn't feel the need. This shows uh, then the roofs are not on the thing yet. And hey, then here's Clark? some photos oh, sorry. that, yeah, yeah, go ahead. On the picture of the bucket on the end of that tractor, can you find yep. that real quick? Yep. You're wondering about the, the welding on the end? Well, that's that's just wear and tear. Yes, that's what that's for. Yeah. <laughs> but the wheel covers. Yes. It's probably that's to keep the grain from getting it. What's it? Yeah, for? that's my guess. To keep keep the grain from getting or the materials from getting in the wheels. Okay, it's, I it's, think it. I think it's for preventing the hubs and the nuts and bolts of the wheel from tearing up the door, the edge of the door. Well, that could be too. But I was thinking, as I said that, that it might also be to keep any oil or grease from getting into the material. That, yeah, that's that, what that's I was thinking. Uh, prevent contamination from. You know. Yeah. Yeah, keep it as clean because as possible. Because when they put the when they put these cars, when they put these cars in this unloading shed, they lowered the doors on both ends. Yeah. So they would put a car in, lower the doors, raise the doors, shove that car out, pull another car in, and uh, lower the doors again, just to try and keep out vermin and birds and things. You can yeah, see. Yeah, I this did a photo. A, go ahead. I did a photo job uh, at Donley R R Donley in Chicago. And their vehicles, their, their propane powered vehicles in the building had covers like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I asked about it and one guy said, oh, it's to, so they don't tear up the boxcar sides or boxcar door openings. And another guy said, because there's a lot of people around that it would help deflect a person um, and not catch on their clothing, the, the, oh, real, the, the nuts and stuff. Yeah, here I don't think that was an issue. There's probably only one or two guys here. Right. But you'll right. notice in the inside of the, this is a New Haven boxcar painted orange one. Uh, but you'll notice on the inside, there's a great big metal patch where the, the wood must have had a hole in it on the back wall of the of the yep. street in front above the bucket. Uh -huh. And it looks like something something else, unless that was part of the grain door, you can see right above the front of the of the Hugh loader. Uh, there's some, yeah. it looks like corrugation or something. Uh, could be the same type of stuff that's on the other side of the car. But anyway, these are, it's interesting stuff. Uh, where was I? Here. Yeah, this is uh, just more photos. Uh, they had a powerhouse there and that big tank would have been for fuel oil, for diesel fuel, for for uh, whatever they use for power for the, if they had uh, diesel generators or steam, whatever, I can't remember. I did some research on this, but I've forgotten. Uh, the two smaller vertical tanks are for uh, additives uh, like uh, fish oil or linseed oil, or not linseed, but cottonseed oil, uh, that kind of stuff. And then there were three tracks here. Uh, you have the, the unloading track first, and this, the company would ask, the railroad, they would give the switch list to the railroad when they came out. 
the rain, they would leave a switch list in that build that shed and they would have a particular order in which they wanted the cars put in at for how they wanted to, what feed they were making. And it's possible that in the lineup the railroad had put in the night before, they didn't use one of the cars and they wanted that put back in. So they would spend a lot of time out there switching this place. Uh, this photo, I put this in here because it shows uh, the type of, of uh, car mover that they used. You can see there right next to the, the, the step on that hopper car, uh, there's a motor and gear case. And then there's a box out here on this end uh, with a pulley in it. And then down on the other end, there's another pulley with a cover over the top. And that those two uh, cables would be would run back and forth or you know continually turn and they had hooks on them and they would hook them on the car and then move it ahead uh and there was a really a problem for the crews at night when they were switching uh not to get tangled up in that thing and the other reason i threw this in here is you'll also notice uh on your standard intermountain wheels how friggin wide the tires are you know when people talk about you want to use scale treads. Uh, I've, I, after seeing this photo, I decided that all of my tank cars and open-end cars were going to have the, the narrow tread wheels on them. <laughs> this is a photo that I took myself. I went out there one day when I was building this thing, and I wanted to find out some stuff, but there was nobody around, so I helped myself to just taking a few photos. And this is inside that unloading shed. And it's used for different stuff now, and you can see they have a newer uh, loader up there. It's still there, but it's a newer one than, than was in the other photo. But it, you can see it does have those cones or those, what we call them, uh, moons, uh, uh, the old uh, hubcaps. Yeah, they were, uh, what, full moons? And, and I can't remember what we called them back in the 650s, 60s, put on cars. Um, but anyway, this is a photo of the inside of that thing. And then this is a comparison between the real place and the, the interior. The only interior I've ever put in anything, I think, was just to put something in there uh, that looked like the real thing. And then here in our old house, I uh, had a uh, two season, three season porch. Uh, and I'm out there uh, putting, uh, laying some track. Nice day like today. Uh, this is a uh, an aerial view of the plant in modern times, and then uh, as I'm laying the track. The, the main difference is uh, you can see the main line, the Milwaukee main line, or the CP in these days, or I think, or whatever, um, would be at the very bottom of the picture uh, past the, the row of trees. And I didn't have that room, so my piece of the main line is, is just uh, a few feet from the shed. And that's it. If you want me, I can go back and look at anything if anybody wants to, or we can go on to the next. A really nice, Clark. <clears throat> Some of those photos, I was having a hard time telling if it was a model or the real thing. The background is looked uh, looked perfect on those last few. <laughs> oh yeah, you know why? Because you're right. Uh, here I've screwed this one up. Let me put this back where it goes. Uh, there's a, yes, you are, uh, you are correctly confused. <laughs> Look at this one. Okay. Now this is a case for so far, uh, grass late summer and also stacking it with their autumn. Because if I can move my mouse, the actual module is setting on, on, uh, sawhorses. And it goes along here and along here. This is the end of the of the model. It's setting in a field, a, a part of a park. Okay. And the back is right here. The yeah. back of the the back of the module is at the back of the of the tower, and the end of the module is at the end of the track. And uh, this stuff matches real stuff as close as you can get. Beautiful. <clears throat> well done. Yeah, so the, there's something to be said for taking outside photos. You know, yeah. you got the real trees and yeah, the yeah. real sky. 
I know a lot of guys can, yeah, a lot of guys can uh, uh, go into Photoshop and replace the model sky with real sky, and that helps a lot. Yeah. Um, and this photo here nowadays, they use that photo stacking where they take 15 or 16 or 20 pictures at different focuses, and then this, this software pushes them all together yeah. so that last car would be as, as in focus as the front of the locomotive. Right. Helicon. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Okay, so I'm done. I'll get rid of me. All right. Thanks, Clark. Uh, Neil, you ready? Ready to roll as soon as Clark, Clark unshares. Yeah, as soon as I figure out how to get out of here. Just there. go up to the top of the screen you're sharing. It'll. There, I'm not. <laughs> that, that's that's a signal nice switch. Yeah. There was a there was a question. Someone had a question for you, Clark. What was that? Down in the chat. Oh, oh look at there. Wanted to know how that payloader was powered, whether it was electrical or battery. Electric. It had a yeah. That's I showed the motor. Electric cable or battery, I guess. Yeah. Oh, it had a cable. It had a power cable to hook to it. You know that might be another reason for those hubcaps is to keep the damn cable from getting caught on the wheels. Yeah. Ah. Okay, show us some more railroads. <laughs> okay, you ready, Greg? I'm ready. Okay. And I just lost one setting here. Okay. So, um, Last week, I showed a number of uh, layouts that I toured at Indy Junction, and uh, but uh, in getting ready, getting ready for last week, I didn't have time to load everything. So this week, we'll show you the additional ones. Plus, uh, since we've got Rod here, we'll start off with uh, uh, what he uh, had at the show, and uh, oops, oh, went too far. So this was Rod's award-winning module at the show, and uh, very well done. If you have any comments to make along the way, Rod, jump in. No comment tonight. <laughs> lots and lots of scratch building there. That is a gorgeous module, and you can understand why it won. Okay, then we're going to jump ahead to uh, where we stopped last week. Okay, this is uh, Jeff Norkin's layout. Indiana flat top and nostalgia, and it's uh, got some little different construction, but uh, as everybody knows, uh, it's your railroad and your rules. So, uh, anybody on a small device, do I need to read the little thing on the left that I have at the front of each section, or should I just give you a minute to read it? Yeah, just give me a go. Just go. Yeah. I've read it. Okay. Clark, by the way, it was nice meeting you down in Indy for in person for a change. Okay. <laughs> well timed cuckoo clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was me. <laughs> I was muted. Yes. Uh, except for I, I uh, fat, my flatulence there. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was good to meet you too. Okay, and then Kurt Crudy's Milwaukee Road. And uh, we've got John Dick on here tonight, so we'll show his uh, layout again, even though we showed that last week. But he's a Milwaukee Road modeler, and I grew up in Milwaukee, so. Uh, Anything Milwaukee Road is of interest to me also. Yeah, 
interesting how he's put the cabinets up on the wall above the layout all the way around and he's got lighting up right underneath the cabinets. That's uh, his workshop. Oh, his workshop? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so here's some pieces of oh. his layout. And it's modeling uh, down on the lakefront where they had the gas plant, uh, where they made gas from coal and whatnot. So uh, in the upper left picture, you see the two smokestacks back here. Uh, this is a view from over here looking at that. And then the upper right picture is looking at the same complex from the far end. But very nicely done. But a lot of his layout is still a plywood Pacific, as it's called. And uh, but he's also going to model the inner urban that went from Milwaukee to Chicago, the yeah. Chicago North Shore and Milwaukee Electroliner. There, uh, I rode those back in the old days before they went out of business in uh, January of '63, and uh, there was a little motorman's compartment in the front, but there was a rail fan seat on the left side uh, for two people. And uh, you can look ahead and count the mile posts and uh, time the miles. And also if uh, you have a cooperative motorman, he puts the uh, shade on the uh, window to the uh, compartment down a little bit so you can see the speedometer. And I recall going 102 miles an hour on the Electroliner, I think between Waukegan and Zion. Uh, somewhere down in that area. So it brings back memories. So, John Dick models the Milwaukee Road Fair Line, and he's on here tonight. So if he wants to stick his oar in the water and comment, um, please uh, do that, John. I did show these last week, but since John's on here, we'll show this section again. That's my son. That's Jake, yeah. Doing a little switching. So the layout starts on the left, lower left corner, goes behind Jake. And then uh, the next picture is continuing on, uh, goes across the back, comes up here turns a corner and then makes an L down in the next corner. It's like a compound S in a way. There you go. There's the next leg of the thing. And uh, so uh, back here is the city scene that's in this uh, next picture on the right. And the last time I saw John's layout was five years or so ago, and he's added tons of detail and very, very nice layout and a compact space. Shows the advantage of the shelf layout. Later on, you'll see another layout in an upstairs like John's is, and it is uh, 10 pounds and a five pound bag. So uh, uh, shelf layouts are a neat way to go. Well, is he from Milwaukee? No. I've never been to Milwaukee. In fact, I've never seen the Milwaukee Road before in person. Oh, you're John. I get it. All right. In fact, I was only ten when the Sioux Line took it over. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've done everything. That What's that? No, I'm not that far. I'm just up in Manitowoc, so it's within striking distance. But evidently, it's not going to work. I uh, I did all the modeling from pictures, books hunting around for things online, talking to guys that lived around it, worked on it. Um, a lot of the photos I worked from were black and white. Right. Back in the days when I drove past it all the time, I didn't take any pictures, so I was no help with that uh, category. That's an interesting comment because there really isn't any video of the beer line of when it was the beer line. Hmm. And I still think there's somebody that has film of it sitting in an attic in a box. Somebody, you know, a relative, an older relative that maybe passed away. 
and they just they have no idea what they're sitting on. Um, well, John, I got one of the Monkey Road fans here. I'll see what I can dig up. You know, I didn't ask Brian Holtz this, but uh, he is a fantastic model railroader that was in Milwaukee back when, was on the cover of Model Railroader, and was the traffic manager for Schlitz oh. back in those days. And there might be a brewery promotion video or something that would have that. I will check with him, but he no longer lives in Milwaukee. But uh, uh, you know, and then he got into the short line railroad business and whatnot, but. Do you uh, take the Milwaukee Society magazine? Yes, I do. I've been a member since. Okay. 2007, 2006. Yeah, they're been a little bit in there about that, but I don't know if there's enough to do any modeling with it. Oh yeah, they got a book. Yeah, I've got the book. Uh, yeah. Art Hynek wrote it. Yeah. And there's mm -hmm. actually in the book, there's a there's a section where he takes you through 24 hours of operation on the entire beer line in the 60s. It's really quite fascinating to read. Mm -hmm. Neil made a comment about traffic manager for Schlitz. Um, <clears throat> Schlitz often had armed guards standing outside the sea houses. Loaded cars would be taken off or pulled out, and they'd haul them up the roller coaster up to the. I guess the main industrial line, if you want to call it that. And some of those armed guards would uh, ride up in the locomotive, the cab up the Humboldt. Just because Schlitz took their security that serious. That's why they never painted their cars with the Schlitz logo. I used to work with some guys that went into law, you know, like on the pier line. You know, they said they would have uh, coats, like trench coats with black pockets that they could bottle, put bottles of beer in there. And nobody said anything until one guy decided to fall off the, the platform and you could hear all that bottle breaking. <laughs> well, like he didn't cut himself up. You know, back in 58 or 59, I managed to get a three hour ride on third shift on a switcher at the Humboldt yard. Um, oh, geez. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, even if I had had well, a camera with me, you can't take too many pictures on third shift. <laughs> yeah. What year, Neil? What year? That was uh, 58 or 59. Okay. That's about a decade before what I model. Okay. Still, though, I've been neat. Well, yeah, stay back on your layout. Any comments you want to make otherwise on your layout, uh, uh, John? Uh, I mean, Improved? all the silos are scratch built. There's what of them is there is all scaled from uh, Sanborn fire maps. Um, the sea house there in front of you, the building that's open, that's an extraordinarily compressed version of two tracks with the two car capacity each. The prototype sea house had six tracks. You could hold six of those cars in each track. There's just no way I could model that to scale. They would have taken up my whole room, especially when you factor in the lead. Yeah. When I worked at, we worked on the Wisconsin Central in Fond du Lac, and then we'd switch out these beer cars that go that went to Diamond just to Diamond Distributing. And I always I always asked them, well, they parked the car right by the yard office. I can understand why. But I said, where's the car with the pretzels in it? <laughs> it's a, it's about as much laughing as I got from them. <laughs> Just said, run in a hopper of peanuts while you're at it, too. Where's sure. The, where's the cuckoo clock when we need it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, move on here. Central Indiana Yardmasters. I think Alan Black's on here tonight. He's in the blue shirt there in the background talking to Rod Thompson. And uh, they both moved at the same time. I They were next to each other as I thought I was taking the picture, but uh, it doesn't work out that way. <laughs> but this is a rather immense layout that is coming along, doesn't have a lot of scenery. Uh, Alan, do uh, the club members each have an area they're responsible for scenery on, or does the whole club work on everything? There's uh, 
there's various different ones that have put some some scenery in, and uh, yeah, like this the picture in the in the lower right was built by a uh, Dan Groninger, and well, both of those actually. Say, right, both this is those. the same view from yeah, yeah two different view. angles. Yeah, yeah, Dan 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 does excellent. He's he does excellent work, and uh, he has a home layout with the area like Kiwana, North Judson. So mm. anyhow, he brought that into into that, and the, there's a power plant down from the down from the uh, the box cars there are that you see, and so anyhow, it it it's coming along. It's get, on around the other side is a woodland. I don't know if you got a picture of that. Uh, no, that's that's the, the up, that's the main yard there on the back here. Yeah, yeah up up on the uh, right front, top right is the main yard, and then the roundhouse down at the far end. And main yard got uh, arrival and departure tracks, and then five uh, staging tracks. That's uh, that's wood. That's the town of Woodland that they we've put together, and it's got a brewery in it and some other things, and and, uh, and then going around the corner there. Bye. <laughs> okay. well, that's Go. all we had on that. Later. Right. So, yeah. Any other comments, uh, Alan? No, not, not really. Okay. Then we're going to move right along. This is Richard okay. Harrison's layout. Yep. And while you're reading that, I'll note here the lighted buildings, lighted billboards, um, lighted signs everywhere. It's uh, He was uh, an engineer, as I recall, for Delco slash Delphi in Kokomo. So uh, very interesting electrical work he's done. You'll see more in a minute. There was his control panel in here. He's in a little hole in the middle of the layout that he gets to via the duck under. And over here on the right, there's room for one person. And along the bottom here, there's room for uh, six more if you're really friendly. They allowed seven up <laughs> the stairs at a time. And uh, that's it. Uh, there is a little crawl out space back here that you can access for working on the layout, but uh, you know, visitors can't get back there. Neil, is that in an attic? This is... Uh, an upstairs yes. room. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it an attic or just an upstairs room, but it's it reminded me of John Dick's area. But he's got the shelf layout all the way around, and he's got room for you know 15 people at a time up there at least. And, if we're very uh, friendly. <laughs> well, yeah, but uh, <laughs> this one is a similar size space, maybe a little bit smaller. But he's got 10 pounds in a five pound bag here. There's the control panel, and uh, you can tell he was an electrical engineer. That's uh, all very professionally done. You know, his GMRI screen up here and whatnot. And he's holding a pointer. He was pointing to different things for different people, explain what they were. Okay, this is right at the top of the stairs as you come in. And uh, so the picture on the right is moving over a little bit and shooting down past this building to what's in the background here. So you can see the tanks. And uh, so that ties into what Clark was talking about earlier with the feed mill there.
but uh, the layout has skirting all the way around very and then uh, backgrounds in various places. Two shots that are very close together, but the one on the right, you can see the uh, track there for the freight cars and then sliding over a little bit, you can see more of the street, uh, very detailed buildings and some with interiors and so on. So that is a room full. Yeah, he's got a lot in there. Okay, and uh, moving across town to Dave Machino's Wildcat Valley. Uh, last week I showed pictures of several helixes and uh, Dave gets to the different levels by just having a 2% grade all the way around the room and uh, has various levels, as you'll see. And this one's maybe 20% scenic right now, double deck. And under the upper deck, he's got LED string lights that he can adjust for various effects for you know storms or daylight or nighttime so on the right side here's nighttime with uh, so you can see the buildings lit and then you can see the lighted switch controller down here and he uses iPads for his uh, controllers nicely done water here with the uh, ripples past the rocks and this the blue down here, that's just the angle I took it at with the lights above. I couldn't quite get in an angle that got rid of that. Nice waterfall. And then down here, nice ripples in the river again. So he's of the modeling school where you uh, put down the track and paint it and then do your scenery and then ballast. And the other half of us put down the track and paint it and ballast and then do the scenery. But, uh, you know, back to rule one. All this stuff stacked up over here on his layout was uh, samples of 3D printed details that he had made, all sorts of things. And I probably could have taken a bunch of slides on that. In fact, I did take some. Uh, for those that weren't here uh, when I was explaining other pictures last week, uh, this presentation has about one in five pictures that I took. I took over 700 pictures at the conference. Okay, Gerald and Tanya Burdick. That's Tanya there. And one of the scenes on their layout is uh, a snow scene in the living room and dining room. And the dining room is connected to the kitchen. So, uh, Actually, their work area for working. So, uh, West Virginia sawmill activity, there's shade down there. 
Yep, I'm just getting a note. My internet connection's unstable. Did anybody else see that? Am I coming yeah. through okay, Greg? Yeah, you. we lost a couple of words here and there, but we're getting a gist. We're good. Oh, okay. Well, sorry. Um, after I left here, I realized I did not take any close-up pictures of Shays. Shays are one of my favorite locomotives and I messed up, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> Neil, if I might add, this is the first time I've ever walked in the front door of a house and immediate to your left was this, the front door of the house, immediately to the left was the layout. Yeah. <laughs> there was no living room. There right, was no, no dining room. room. No dining room yeah. It was all dedicated. Two thirds of the floor plan of the first floor was dedicated to this railroad. That's dedication. <laughs> True dedication. It was dedicated to it all. Yeah, I know. That makes a difference. Look at that. Okay, and uh, last week I showed uh, some of Matt Hewitt's layout because I went there on Friday. It was so good, and it was also open on Sunday that I went back on Sunday to get pictures from other angles because I realized I missed some things. And uh, there's just detail everywhere. And here's his work area, and that's a little diorama right up above it. And I don't even remember if that was part of the layout going through there or if it was a separate diorama. Hey, it's really tastefully done. Mm -hmm. And last week you saw that bridge from a couple other angles and uh, so that's the picture I'm using for a background on my picture tonight. So uh, uh, I just was impressed by that modeling because the uh, bottom of the valley down here is about 18 inches off the floor. And the uh, scenery goes almost to the ceiling. As you're coming into the layout room, um, you go past the helix, and one level of the helix is all scenic up here. And then he's it's basically a two-level layout back here, as showed last week. And I think, well, and you see on the right over here too, looking at the lower level and up above is another layer that's equally detailed. So uh, this one we went through last week, but uh, we're almost to the end. So uh, let me just click through a code. So if anybody wants to read that, let me leave it there a minute. So uh, this is Richard Seymour. He's in the Central Indiana Division, obviously, but uh, uh, he has been to some of our Michiana Division conferences. So he recognized me when I so I'm down at the conference and then again at the layout. And the division gets its name from this tunnel that was bypassed by the open cut. And so that gave it the name of the rat hole division. Mm. Just neat. Yeah, so the picture on the right is using a wide angle lens right at the doorway. And uh, 
So the yards and whatnot are in the back. And then uh, this is his office table and work area right here facing toward us, just to that side of the door. Not a huge layout, but very nicely done. Two shots of the same scene from different angles. This is container yard. The back wall in the back corner. So I had to zoom in to get a picture of that. Okay, one more picture here. This is a video actually. So that was on an S scale modular layout that was in the lobby at the uh, Marriott. And uh, I have a bunch more pictures of that and of other layouts. So uh, maybe I can share some of those in a future week. But uh, oops. Uh, some references here. If you want to look at some of the things, the conference information is uh, still online. Uh, we had an 84-page book that uh, showed everything. The uh, layout descriptions that included a QR code. You click on that and it gave you the map. First time I've seen that done on a uh, layout tour situation and that worked out very well. There were over 500 people there and uh, I will not add all the contest models to this uh, presentation because the Midwest region has done a wonderful job of putting them on their home page and in the latest issue of the Waybill. So uh, M MR, that's a typo. It should be MWR. <laughs> MWR NMRA.org. And uh, so uh, we'll get that fixed. And uh, so we'll throw it back over to uh, Greg. All right. Well done, Neil. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clark. And thanks, everybody, for coming. It's uh, 729, so we'll call it a night. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.